Hi, this is Serena, founder and director of Breaking Taboo. Welcome to our video audio podcast. Today, I am here with Dan Richards, who is a professional life liver, (laughs) self-proclaimed. So I love that. What is that all about? (laughs) What Um, does that mean? It's just different, isn't it? Um, So I love talking to people and you know, what a better way um, than breaking the ice and just getting people a, a bit of a surprise because guaranteed, if you don't, it's the arm. And it's like, oh. people are like, I, 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 I don't know how to address this. So like, professional life liver, and it kind of, like, and then get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, well, I mean, I love it because aren't, aren't we all kind of professional life livers? I mean, why are we, you know, I just had a whole post about this, about like, why is it that, you know, as a society, we are so locked into our professions? You know, it's like, that's the first thing that people really uh, want to know. Like, what do you do? And I don't know, what's a better way to ask to get to know someone? I think, do you know what? Just a conversation, like just be genuinely interested in what the person has to say. And it's like every single person has got a story. And if you're mm-hmm. willing to listen, you'll find yourself quite humbled by a lot of them. Um, with that said, Dan, <laughs> I'd like to get into what's your story. <laughs> so, so my story really, I mean, um, really goes back to like being eight years old. Um, I grew up in a military family and... And that was, you know, off the back of that, um, watching my dad go off to work um, in his army uniform, because he was in the military, he was in the army as well, but watching him every day go off to work in his, in his, in his um, fatigues, um, I, I said at eight years old to my, my mum and dad, I said, when I'm old enough, I'm going to join the army and be just like dad. And, and that's exactly what I did. So from a very, very young age, exactly where I want to go, Um, I know exactly who I want to be and where I'm going. Um, And I had everything planned out. Uh, And that's exactly what I did. And uh, at 17, off I went and started, um, I think we call it, well, we call it basic training. In the States, we call it boot camp. So Mm -hmm. in total, I spent 10 years in the uh, the British Army. Um, Wow, that's a long time. Sorry, how how long is uh, boot camp or uh, basic training in England, in the UK? So it... It really depends on what you do, so the trade that you do, so the, the career you want to do in the military. I it's see. all very different and, and, and time, uh, time dependent. So, I mean, okay. for me, it was three months. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. um, very hard kind of lessons to be learned, if you like. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, the first 12 weeks, the first six weeks, if you like, are all about breaking you down mm-hmm. uh, and... and weeding out the, the the ones that aren't mentally robust enough to, to, to put up with it mm-hmm. um, and then after those first six weeks it's about building you up into who the the military want you to be you know self self-sufficient self-reliant you know um, installing the core values in you um, for you to take away onto mm-hmm. whatever sort of trade you go on to do so now see that's actually you learn a lot very very quickly and if you yeah. don't learn um, you, you, you will learn. <laughs> yeah, how, uh, just curious, how is the UK with veterans? Like, how does the, the UK treat veterans? Like, do you have a lot of um, good uh, services after you, because honestly, um, I, I think, feel like the US yeah. does not do a good job. That's just my opinion. A lot of people's opinions, yeah. like we often forget, unfortunately, about our veterans here, which I just find like appalling, but, um, and very unfortunate. But yeah, how's the UK with that? Um, Joe, you know, I, I certainly think if it wasn't for the charities that are here, um, mm. it would be a lot worse off than it, than, than, than it is. I mean, I don't know what the figures are, but the, the, the veteran homelessness um, is, it, well, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a figure, to be honest. Um, yeah. uh, the same with veteran suicide as well. I, I don't know what the exact figures are, but, you know, for me, you've got people who volunteer to go and do whatever country's dirty work. Um, right. And when they come back, exactly, it's kind of like you're 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 just an expendable resource, really. Um, and it's, I mean, it's yeah, you if you give I your you risk your life. Than, yeah. Sorry, you were saying what? 
<laughs> I said, uh, uh, you risk your life. I mean, that's the one thing that I, I don't understand is people go, they risk their lives for their country and then they come back and they're treated like crap, you know? And I just like never, can never understand that ever. Um, I have a lot of friends who are veterans um, actually, and it's just appalling, baffling. I just think for the most part, the worst people of society get treated you know, a damn sight better than than veterans and I, I don't I don't know I can't speak for the US but certainly um, in the UK you know the, the, you know, the, 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 the scumbags of society that do awful things to innocent people um, get treated a, a lot better than a lot of the veteran community um, mm-hmm. I mean I mean the, interesting the yeah. homelessness for one thing I mean i if you, if you, it, I was having a conversation with someone a, a while ago, and yeah, he he was in the military, and he basically fallen on hard times. Um, you know, he, he, he couldn't get help. He turned to alcohol, and just the whole world fell apart. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I saw him, what? Um, over the course of a month, I saw him about five times at the same place, mm-hmm. and during that month, um, he. Um, he'd managed to get himself accommodation and um, Mm -hmm. I think an interview as well for a job. So there is help out there, but it's, it's not a lot of, a lot of veterans don't know about the help that's out there. So you've got the obvious ones over here. We have big charities like help for heroes, Belesma, Mm -hmm. um, there's the the Royal British Legion. There's, There's so many charities out there. But then there's the ones that in between that do that do sort of the work, um, like the smaller ones they, that they people do don't small, really do smaller work, hear about. Smaller, lesser known charities that do amazing yeah. things. Yeah. But yeah. the thing is, because because they're not as well known, mm-hmm. people don't know a lot about them, and mm-hmm. and and so it's. it's That's what I feel like about they, breaking taboo probably, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally know what you're saying. Yeah, no, oftentimes those uh, smaller charities work their butts off, you know, to be able to um, but little recognition. do amazing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, everyone has to start somewhere. So, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's always good to um, get supporters and stuff. But um, um, so I wanted to ask, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, was it through the um, uh, Afghanistan that you lost your arm or how did you, how did that happen? It wasn't actually, no, I oh. came back. I came back completely unscathed. Um, shortly after Afghanistan, I went trekking through Nepal in the Himalayas. So I uh, got a, a little bit more worldly experience, learning about different cultures. Um, I remember I said, I'm gonna be a farrier, but before I do that, I've, I've got some boxes to take. I wanna do an operational tour and I wanna do some adventurous training. So I did Afghanistan, I did Nepal. I said, right, I'm ready to focus on now uh, what I'm gonna do the rest of my career in the military and the rest of my life really, until I retire. Um, and we had um, one of the big parades going on. So Troop in the Colour, Queen's Birthday Parade. And so it was agreed that once we'd finished that, this was 2009 now, once we'd finished that, um, I would go back to the stables um, and, and start working my way into the forge where the farriers work. Um, and we did one we did one full dress rehearsal. Um, so you, you always do a, a full, everyone's in full regalia, full uniforms, uh, crowds are watching, bands and, and, and the guards marching around. Um, full on parade, just not the actual one, it's just a rehearsal. And um, I did the first full dress rehearsal. The following day, uh, I went out of the barracks. On my way back, I was on my motorbike. I, I had a a crash, I crashed into central reservation, and mm. I woke up four days later in hospital. My my arm and shoulder had been amputated. So, wow. um, so I it was no a, what So it was because you were on a motorbike. Motorbike as a motorcycle or as a motorcycle. No? Yeah, okay. motorcycle. Okay. Um, so it was a motorcycle accident. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. How did you feel like when you woke up from it? Um. When I woke up from hos- uh, in hospital, um, and you realized free. that, yeah, and you realized that your your arm was gone. Like, how did that? How I did had no idea to start with. Oh, wow. I had no idea. Um, 
So I was, I was in a coma. I was put into a coma in the road. Um, um, and I was woken up sort of three days later in hospital. I think it was three, two, three days later. I can still see it now. My mum and my dad was looking over me. Yeah, no, the, the, um, the doctor woke me up, gave me the good news, told me, you know, what's happened, what the situation is. And when they said, unfortunately, after six and a half hours of surgery, we were unable to save your arm and shoulder, um, I looked over and where this should have been was the pillow. There was nothing there. And I got a little bit upset. Um, and I just pulled the nurse. Uh, I said, I said, okay, is, is the plumbing still attached and working? Um, she said, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> And it got a few laughs. It got a few laughs. Yeah. And I suppose looking back at that moment now, that's the moment I accepted my situation for what it was. I, mean, I was only young. I was 23 at the time. Oh, um, wow. But um, she said, no, um, that's all fine down there. That's all attached. And that's all fine. And I said, well, you know what? Nothing else really matters. So there's people worse off than me, isn't there? This is a scratch compared to some. I can get over this. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, yeah, like I just said, you know, looking back on that moment, that's the moment I accepted my situation. But that in itself afforded me the mental capacity, if you like, to get used to this new way of life. You know, my, my right arm's gone. Mm -hmm. I was right hand dominant. So I had to learn everything uh, left handed, um, mm -hmm. everything from right into eating to, you know, getting dressed and, and all, all, all the nitty gritty bits in between. But, um, um, so that was pretty, uh, uh, pretty soon. It sounds like you accepted it right there um, in the hospital bed, uh, relatively soon. Compared to, I'm saying, compared to a lot of people. I mean, some people never accept it. Some people take years. I mean, it's that's actually quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I suppose I I had accepted it. Um, I suppose I found out three years later when I left the military. Um, it all sort of came back to me, but um, you know, that's a little bit later on, but um, yeah, it's, I suppose I, I put a lot of it down to being in the military. I mean, you're, you're, it's kind of drilled into you um, mm. from the early, early days of boot camp, basic training. Um, you need to be self-reliant, self-sufficient. So it, you know, making the best out of the worst situation. You know, if you just focus on one problem, you know, what, what aren't you focusing on? So you kind of have to take a step back from everything take a, and look at it from like a third person perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, because one, one thing's going wrong or has gone wrong or it's mm -hmm. gone completely sort of pear-shaped. If you focus on that one thing, what are you not focusing on? What, what else could go wrong? Because then, and that's kind of how... That's what the military teaches is don't focus I, on I the suppose, one thing that yeah, goes in wrong. A way, in a way, but... I mean, that's pretty wise, yeah. Yeah, it's... I put a lot of that. I put a lot of the early days, uh, yeah, of, of of post injury. I put a lot of it down to, you know, being in the military and the military mm -hmm. training I received. Um, but I, I suppose the way I looked at it, saying that there's people worse off than me. You know, there are people living in a lot worse situations than I than I, than I do. Mm -hmm. That deal that you know that cope with it, or they, they they make it their normal. Do you know what I mean? So I was mm -hmm. very keen to make this my new normal, and and that's kind of what. I did, and um, my the first goal I ever set uh, was in hospital. Um, I got wheeled into the toilet in a commode, and they said, "When you're finished, pull the orange cord, and someone will come and tidy you up." Um, and I was, you know, 23 year old, you know, man. And I was, I'm not, no, like I'm not. I know, I know it's your job to look after me. I said, but I have the capacity to, you know, clean myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn to do it because I don't, I don't want that. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to do that. And so in a way I kind of took back control of my life mm -hmm. in a way, if you know so what I mean? You refuse to be a victim of your circumstances. Wait, yeah. I, I, and that's, that's been my mindset from, 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 from day one post injury is mm -hmm. yes, it's bad. What's happened to me. People have gone through worse. Um, yes, it's bad. Mm -hmm. It's a bit toilet to have to go through. But I chose not to be a victim of my circumstance. It doesn't mean right. I'm not trying to desensitize anyone. What you've background. gone through, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think we all as individuals have a responsibility to take well, I responsibility was going, for ourselves. 
Yeah, I was going to ask about that is um because it seems like you you and I think you may maybe touched upon this a little bit, but um it seems like you accepted it so fast, you know, like in the hospital bed. And that makes me curious. Uh, you did mention that later on in life it caught up to you. So was that was that like true, like real one hundred percent acceptance, or did were you was there a, a part of that where it was like, okay, like I'm gonna mentally compartmentalize this or or block it off or just you know not really think about it and then later on in life did that have an effect on you because I also remember in our earlier conversation um, uh, prior to this and just getting to know you uh, you had mentioned that you have experienced depression um, before right yeah, yeah. So, so for me um, I had accepted my situation for what it was I, I, that was that was you know my my, my attitude to it was you know, a quarter of my upper body is gone and it's never coming back. So there's no point in pining after it because no matter how far advanced medical science gets, it's not going to grow back. I had accepted my situation for what it was. Um, I was now a one-armed man um, with the use of a hand that I've never had to use for anything before. Um, and so I set little goals in hospital. So I learned to write, you know, the alphabet with my left hand. I'd write my name. And then, and then, and then once I got to a... Uh, you know, a, a, a substantive level of handwriting, I would then focus on the presentation of my handwriting. And, and that's kind of what I did. And that was just one little thing of winning my independence back. Because for me, I didn't want anyone doing anything for me. I returned to the military after rehab. I think I was off for six months altogether. Went back to the military. And for me, it was like, well, I want, I'm going to stay in the military. Um, but I don't want to be sort of in the corner collecting dust. Um, so I kind of wanted to earn my spot back in the military. So I got my fitness back up again. So I go out running. Um, I, I can't do press ups. I can't do pull ups. Um, but there's no point in focusing on things that you can't do. Um, it's a, it's a very toxic circle and it's a very sort of long way down a dark hole. But so you focus on so my focus was on things. What can I do? Well, I can run at the time I can run. Um, I can do I can do various other things as well, and I you thought, like, well, right? You, you ride bicycles, and now nowadays you're a cyclist. Oh, that's, that's right? that was I ride bicycles now, um, but you know, but I you're known for that. Do. Like you, uh, sorry, you, you're known for that, right? Do you compete and everything? Like, are you? Uh, uh, I don't. Race, I don't compete or? on a professional level. Um, mm -hmm. I did the Evictus Games, and that was kind of a goal that I set in 2016, but. Um, you know, I went back to the military for three years. I was discharged, medically discharged, medically retired. Um, and that's kind of when my, you know, what, that was 2013. And so the whole of 2013, I've kind of written off really as the worst year of my life. I came out of the military. Um, I did as much as I could during mm -hmm. my transition out of the military to kind of hit the ground running in a sense. You know, um, I met, I, I did some education to buff up my CV. Um, and that whole year, well, it wasn't even a year, it was eight months, but that eight months became about 327 trip, 327 job applications, of which not one led to anything sub basic. So no, no networking event, no, no interview, no, no, no replies. Running parallel with all of that. Um, was I, I was living at home with my mum and dad in, in essentially my old room. Um, I couldn't get a job. I was living on my savings. That ran out after a while. Did not um, getting a job have anything to do with... Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, oh. I, I, I think it does. Um, because, because I couldn't get a job, I was on benefits. Um, I... I... I ran out of money to, you know, by the end of it. Or I, I had 15... 15 pence to my nail, 15 cents to my name. And, um, you know, after 10 years in the military and the things I've achieved and I've done, I was like, this is what I've got to, you know, what have I really got to look forward to? Um, what I didn't know, like you said earlier, was, you know, I was depressed. I was massively reclusive. Um, everyone else could see it. I couldn't. And I think that's one of the things, that, that's the main thing with depression, I think, is you're always in denial that you have it. 
Um, Hmm. it's just another bad day you know actually oftentimes it's opposite oftentimes it's um um the person feels depressed and he like the person themselves um and know about it but no one else around them like recognizes really? it yeah and everyone else around them is like oh yeah. they're just having a bad day or oh they're just going through something or oh they're just drinking a lot right now and they don't really recognize it as as signs yeah so oh. but that's very interesting to hear that it's interesting that, yeah, that it's yeah, that everyone yeah that I've spoken to about it, yeah, Dan, we knew, we knew you were depressed. We knew you What were, did they do about it? Uh, did they do anything or did I they try they, to tell they you? they try and tell you. I think in the end, in the end, a lot of people that I know, well, have known who, are de- who, who have been depressed, they, they don't, well, a lot of them said that they're, they're not. Mm. And then they come around to it. Um, mm. But, yeah, I think for me, my, my, my mum ended up getting in touch with one of the charities, um, which kind of um, which kind of set me on on uh, on, a, on a on a on a path to, I suppose, success compared to where I come from. But you what know, did that, this charity that, do? So they, um, as as luck would have it, so well, I say luck would have it, but towards the end of that year, um, I was like do you know what? I can't get a job. I've got no money. I live at home with mum and dad. I'm 27 years old at the time. Most people my age, you know, getting on the property ladder, they're getting well established in their careers and starting families. And here I am living in my old room, like a 16 year old child that's left school. Um, and I've got nothing to show for my 10 years in the military. And I can't get nothing to show. To be honest, if this is what life's got installed for me, I'd really rather not be part of it. And so I tried to, I tried to end it all. Um, and I got halfway through doing it. Um, what did you do? I tried to hang myself um, mm. um, with a with a with a dressing gown belt, with a get with a bathrobe belt, and um, I got halfway through doing it. Um, and what stopped me was the thought of my mum finding me, because um, mm. my whole family went had been through it with me, and I couldn't bear the thought of mum coming home from work finding me sort of dead in my room. So that's what stopped me. And, and I said, I need, I need help. You know, I need, I need to get back to London. Um, mm. And that was eight years ago. And the charity um, that sort of initially helped me with that was um, a, a new startup had um, just begun employing members of the military, uh, so veterans, with the percentage of the workforce uh, being what we call wounded, injured and sick. Mm-hmm. So mental and physical injuries because of service or during service. Mm-hmm. Um, there needs as, to be a lot more of that, I think. Yeah, in the US yeah. as well. It's just, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I think doing that um, as a, you know, as, as, as a, as a, as an organization, you know, any organization, you've got an untapped resource and untapped skill set, you know, that's been acquired over so many years through so many different experiences. And it gives you a whole different kind of level of looking at something. So, um, so what did you end up doing? Uh, work I was wise. a chauffeur. Oh. You know what? The people that I was driving were the complete polar opposites of how I was living. So I was driving, you know, successful people, the rich, famous sometimes. Um, and, you know, during, during my time with the chauffeur company, I was hired help, if you like, eight of us hired help for the Royal Muse, so we were driving foreign diplomats and royalty round at some point. Um, How did that make you feel? I became a bit of a, a sponge, if you like, um, in that I, I spent a lot of time in these people's personal space. Um, and so I, I was like, well, what, what makes these people tick? What gives them their get up and go? What are their routines? Um, because clearly it's working for them. <laughs> Sounds so, like me all the time. <laughs> always yeah. wondering those questions really? with everyone yeah everyone so yeah what makes people tick what yeah makes them get yeah, up what, in the what morning, gives them they yeah. get up and go what what's their reason to get up in the morning what do they do about their day how does their day work what and are what they doing i just started cherry picking little things like personality traits if you like because i had nothing i was a blank canvas mm. um and um i kind of reinvented myself if you like and um and then i just had a bit of an epiphany one day and i said you know what 2014 i don't care what opportunity i get from this day on i don't care what it is i'm just going to say yes and do it 
because you never know where it's going to lead. And so off the back of that decision, um, you know, I qualified as a scuba diver in 2014. I learned oh, wow. to fly a plane. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I've always been fascinated by airplanes. Um, and I got a, I, I got a flight lesson and, and it was... Um, have you? I yeah. never got my PPL though. Well, I just took one lesson, but it was um, uh, actually... I was like internally, I was like kind of freaking out because I had developed a fear of heights. Um, suddenly, oh, ap- after well, after uh, a good friend of mine um, jumped from a building and killed himself, all of a sudden I developed a fear of heights. For like, never had this fear ever in my life. I'd been skydiving. I'd been on like the top, like the highest points of of you know, uh, buildings and towers and bridges. Never ever had a fear of heights, and then all of a sudden. I had one. So I almost like forced myself to say yes to um, the plane ride to face this fear. It was scary at first, but then, you know, you're up there and you're like, okay, all right, you know, this is actually really fun. And yeah, <laughs> I still, I still have a little bit of fear. So maybe I should take some more plane lessons. Do you know what? I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I read a, I listened to, um, I listened to a lot of motivational videos in the morning whilst I'm getting ready. Something you know is is six um, was it six rules of success and so on like videos like that. Will Smith did one, and some of he said something and it was um, you know absolute or absolute happiness is on the other side of fear, mm. and he's right. He's right. He's absolutely right. I just never got over my fear of spiders. So <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you. Um, um so okay so wait so how did you how did you get through your depression um because it sounds like it was pretty bad especially if you know it was like suicidal uh depression um how did did you ever get help for it well you said the charity that gave you employment as a job did that was that what really like sparked your recovery yeah yeah absolutely um um in a way, uh, being being at home and not not having a job, not 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 having anything to do, you kind of feel worthless if you like. You've got no purpose in life whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And you think when you're in the military, um, you, you you have you have a reason to get up. You have a reason to you know turn up on time. You have a reason to do this, this, and this. And it's, it's routine is massive, and it's it's a massive part of my life. It's a massive tool for my life. I need absolutely need routine. Um, mm-hmm. When you don't have that, you you feel like a lost. You feel you feel lost. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I, coupled with the fact that I kind of felt like a drain on society, really. Uh, I wasn't sort of contributing to anything. I wasn't I wasn't worth anything. I wasn't doing anything. Um, so it's kind of having yeah. having everything to do then having nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how how much a sense of purpose um, will do for a person. Yeah. I mean, I I've always said that that is one of the keys to happiness is having a sense of purpose and knowing your sense of purpose. And people find I mean, it in all different things. Mm-hmm. Even just to get up and make yourself a cup of tea. Can I ask you something? I was yeah. uh, always curious. Um, uh, so would you like going back in time like w- would you have given up riding a motorcycle um uh, for uh, if if it could have prevented your accident or no is it all a part of the journey and you're th- and you're glad that you you know got to do it i i i tell everyone this um i i absolutely unequivocally wouldn't change anything um, uh, I stand by the fact that losing my arm and shoulder is fundamentally the the single most greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, wow! How so? I've, I've done so much with my life like this. It's 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 afforded me opportunities. It's also exposed me to opportunities. Um, the people I've met, the things I've done. Uh, I think is it, it would be hundred percent certain. Would not have happened if this not if if this not if this had not have happened. Um, it's almost like something that makes you like uh, special, right, and and unique in that, and and gives you um, uh, a, a, another purpose, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's 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 it gave me a whole different outlook 
and at the same time an appreciation for, for life itself like um a lot of, you know i've i've done away with this whole where do i want to be in a year where do i want to be in five years I've, i'm not i'm not about that anymore um it's like goal setting for me became is, is a fundamental part of, i never knew how how life-changing goal setting would become you know like now but in part of my life but um I, I think, you know, you can't look at a year down the line what you want to do if you're not living for today. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So do good today and you'll have a good day tomorrow. You do well then, you'll have a good day the day after that. And before you know it, you've got seven good days that have made up a week. Weeks make up months, months make up years. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, if, you always, if you always look at, you know, five years' time, ten years' time and so on, so you're saying that you live, uh, what's helped you is living day by day and being present, basically. Yeah. So right? Instead me, of concentrating and, so much on the future. Yeah. So I try and do, I go out of my way to do good, good things for people. And I think I do, uh, for me, it's about helping somebody mm-hmm. that, that can't do anything for you. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if I see a homeless man on the street, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go and chat to him. I'll say, oh, do you want a coffee? Mm-hmm. You, know, you want something to eat and um and so i'll get him a coffee but then i'm thinking what's the coffee going to do well, i'll get him some sandwiches and a bag of crisps or something so right. and then you, you know it's yes you know what you could probably do so with you know a couple of pounds or something that you give him but if you give him something to to eat or and drink he's not mm-hmm. gonna have to use the money that he's been begging for on 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 living he can keep it for something else and it's it's like i'm a big believer in helping people that can do literally nothing for you and why is that for you? Because I know what it's like to be at rock bottom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Nobody wants to be, well, as far as I know, nobody wants to be homeless on purpose. Nobody wants yeah. to be, you know, at rock bottom on purpose. Nobody wants, nobody wants to feel less than what they actually are. Does it? Because, okay, so I, I know with depression, like I've experienced depression before. I obviously am in this field. I I know a ton of people that, that have experienced depression. I've lost a lot of friends to suicide. So I'm very well aware of uh, how depression works. Um, so I'm curious for you, your personal experience, does it ever come back? Is it something that like you're constantly having to um, check yourself with or it was it because it's different for everyone also. Was it like just that like one time thing? Um, you know, it's like real talk, <laughs> you know, right now, yeah. but um, yeah. I think, I don't know, I've never had it come back. Um, I think I, once I finally identified the fact that, you know, I tried to end my life, once I identified that that's not a normal thing, um, I, 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 I began to put things in place. So I need to get back to London was, was the first goal I set out the back end of, of my, my, my rock bottom became the foundations of which I've rebuilt my, 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 my entire life, you know, up to today. Um, so because I was depressed, I suppose in a way, if, if, if I, if I knew or I could, I could visualize that it was coming back, I would go the other way. I, I, I do other things, you know, so like forming habits and so on. So, I mean, at the minute, so now, not the minute, but now, I purposely avoid negative people and situations. Like I don't get involved in it. Um, mm-hmm. um, just because I, I can't, I, I just said basically that anything that costs me, you know, an ounce of my mental wealth and my mental health is already too expensive. I'm not prepared to, you know, to spend it. Do you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, kind of preach this, this is how you never get depressed again sort of thing. But um, because it, it, it always come out, I don't know what will happen, you know, next month, next year, something, might, something bad might happen. But, but until then, I don't know. I don't want to know. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I can only do good today mm-hmm. and lead on to tomorrow. Right, um, right. You know, what happened yesterday, last week, last month, I can't control that. Mm-hmm. So there's no point in trying to. I can just control here and now. 
Right. Um, so this whole thing has taught you that like you can't really control what happens to you in life um, type thing. But with that said, I know that you said that you don't believe in the like five year, 10 year plan. But do you have like a vision for yourself? Do you envision yourself like, you know, um, like what do you uh, what are your goals, I guess, now since you set <laughs> goals for so, yourself? So I, I, for me, my end goal, I just want to be successful in whatever it is I do. So um I mean, I have a full-time job, um, and just through the cycling, you know, I, which I oh, excuse me, it's okay. just through the cycling, um, you know, when I picked up cycling, I, I used Instagram to sort of track my performance. Um, mm -hmm. Whilst I was doing that, I was training to compete in the Invictus Games, so that was another goal that I set, and just through doing that, I was approached by, you know, a, a modeling agency, um, a long story short, I got signed to an agency. I got signed. I got a modeling contract. Basically, um, that's not my sole source of income. I, mean, I have a full time job. But um, why do you think um, people respond so well to uh, to you and cycling? What's that? Sorry. Why do you think people respond so well? Uh, are responding so well um, and so supportive of you and cycling? Like, what do you I think, think it is that really speaks out to people? I think because they see, you know. They see somebody, I don't know, they see somebody with one arm riding the bike relatively well. Um, and they, they do, they find it inspiring, I suppose. And yeah, they do. I get told a lot of the time, you know, I think you're inspiring and incredible and stuff. And like, I used to get really sort of like uncomfortable around it um, mm. a, 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 a while ago when I first started out. But now it's, it's a compliment. And I, mm -hmm. something that I've struggled with um, sort of, well until about 2017, 18, um, was confidence. Told that, you know, I'm inspiring, I've inspired somebody to do something or, or somebody's motivated to want to do something with their life because they've seen me out riding a bike. It's a massive compliment. And, you know, I've always said, if I can help just one person, right. um, it's, it's then, then I've it. done something right for that, you know, for a day. Um, mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. just boils down to doing something good for a day. It's not about finding something to go and do good. Mm -hmm. It's just doing it like. Yep. Humanity is like a part of us as, as human beings. We want to help each other out type thing. So why not? You know, the way that I see it's always like, well, if I can, why not? What do I, what do I have to lose? Like nothing, you know? And if I really believe in a mission or a purpose or something, and I feel like I can help people, like, why not? So I totally get what you're saying. I absolutely 100%. Um, yeah understand where you're coming from with that and that's why i find like the real do-gooders <laughs> that's where it stems from you yeah, know <laughs> i mean it's all about i mean help somebody selflessly doesn't matter what you can get out of it is that that's not what it's about you know yeah it's, you could never talk to the person these... again and who cares like yeah no one yeah. no one needs to witness this you know or the holy being out there does uh, you know not need to witness it like it's not about that you know yeah um I think, uh, well, it's um, just just help somebody because it's it's the decent human thing to do. Doesn't matter mm -hmm. what it looked like, um, you know how bad. Even if it's just a smile, that mm -hmm. one smile could change somebody's day. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can definitely tell you, obviously, you know, uh, why people think um, you're inspiring and, and you inspire them. I mean, just everything that you've uh, told me about, like throughout this uh, podcast, video cast, um, you know, the way that you handled your circumstances, the way that you, you know, kept moving forward, the way that um, you had the courage enough to, uh, you know, to um, take a good hard look at yourself and, and go you know, and go back home instead of, you know, ending your life and, and, you know, um, um, and keep going and just never being a victim of your circumstances type thing. That is a mentality that is, um, I think not that common. It is a bit more rare and whether that's because of your military training or, you know, just the way that you were born or the way that you're raised or like, you know, the reason behind it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you are quite resilient um, as a human being, and as you said, a professional life liver. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I think, I think the societal norms from what I've witnessed is it's always somebody else's fault. Like, everyone's pointing their finger, you know, I got up late this morning, it's your fault. You know, I was late for the bus, it's your fault. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. 
what part of it are you taking responsibility for? And it's like, everyone's always looking for somebody else to blame. Like mm. nobody wants to take responsibility for their actions. Like, um, uh, the, you know, the, the victim mentality is, I don't want to say it, but it's kind of rife. You know, and I think, again, that's why people do um, look up to you is that, you know, you don't allow for a victim mentality. You're just living your life, you know, still helping other people, still being being you, Dan, you know, being yourself and 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 um doing all these things and bicycling and whatever, you know, it doesn't matter. It just it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Although I do yeah, want to think... ask you, sorry, <laughs> if you want no, to add no, to I that. Think, I think it's great actually that you uh, that, that you said that actually. It's um I don't want anyone thinking like, you know, so really bad has happened therefore you know don't don't be a victim of it it's like uh, victims of circumstance i.e you know um getting up late being late for work not doing well at your job or whatever but actually then but then being victim of of you know of, of you know things into mental health conditions rape um child abuse and that that that's not part of the conversation do you know what i mean that's 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 you know i've got i've got friends that have been victims of that and 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 um you and know, it does it profoundly affect your whole life it really absolutely does, yeah. i mean i wanted to ask you like on a day-to-day -day basis how much does it uh, affect your life like do you think about it at all or no or is it just no do you know what i see how i am now um that this is my normal i was going to write not, I wasn't going to write a book, but um, somebody said, that, Dan, you should definitely write a book. And I was like, well, what would I call it? And I said, I went, I went home and I, said, I was like, um, was it living extraordinarily normally? Um, extraordinarily normally? Living... Yeah. Could you repeat that? <laughs> living extraordinarily normally. Oh, okay. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I, I just thought that's quite a bit of a ring to that. Yeah. But, yeah, well, I mean, on your uh, uh, Instagram, uh, it's called yeah. Dan the One Armed Wonder, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that speaks for itself, like right there, the way that you. Well, I think because do you know what, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a man with one arm. I'm a man that has one arm. Yeah. You know I mean, I'm not, def I'm not defined by this. It doesn't exactly. define me. Like, I'm not oh the guy with one arm. I'm, I'm the guy who just happens to have one arm, do you know what I mean? So it's- I think you hit it on the head there because I think that's that's kind of along the lines of what we were talking about with the victim mentality. Yeah, is that like, you know, it doesn't have to like define you, you know, whatever yeah. happens to you does not necessarily mean like, like you are this thing that happened to you, you know? It's you're so much yeah, more than that, yeah. Hmm, it's, um, yeah, exactly, exactly like you said, doesn't define me. It's, something bad has happened to me. Like something bad has happened to me. It fundamentally changed my life. You know, now I see it for the better, but it's fundamentally impacted my life for the rest of my life. But it doesn't define who I am as a person. Like mm -hmm. it's Yeah, it was like yeah. blessing blessing in disguise. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Part of me thinks it was meant to happen. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, and at the same time, you know, um, because it, it, it did have a profound effect. So you are obviously, um, uh, you are obviously um, doing um, uh, great things w with it and, and sharing uh, like great messages to people out there. So I want to ask you with that said, um, to wrap things up, I always like to ask this question. Um, what are some words of advice or inspiration that you can give to someone who has experienced something similar to maybe um, someone who has just recently woken up and, and found out that they're uh, missing a limb? Um, rock bottom isn't the final destination. Like um, this, you know, one, the, the bad things that have happened, it's not the end. It's just part of the journey. Um, and I suppose in a way, what's, what, what, what has happened to you, how you deal with it is going to define who you are. Um, you know, I've come to find out exactly what I'm capable of. Um, so yes, it's bad that it's happened. Um, 
and we as 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 people that had bad things happen to us we have to accept it acknowledge it accept it and then rebuild with that as part of your foundations if you look at your life as a story that's the first chapter mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah beautiful beautiful first chapter of your life as a story love it well thank you so much dan um it's been such a pleasure having you and uh yeah and and we'll definitely be in touch enjoy your quarantine covid for now <laughs> and maybe i'll see you when you uh come out to california for your race hopefully yeah i'll let you know i'll let you know but thanks for a great conversation yeah you too yeah thank you so much have a great day okay bye everyone i'll see you soon bye <laughs>